Hey everybody, it's Gomledex, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena. Today, quick drafts of Phyrexia All Will Be One have officially gone live on Arena, so we're going to be hopping into that format and seeing how the bots like to draft the format. As always, this is similar to any regular Premier Draft, but instead of drafting with players, we are drafting with bots, so we have unlimited time to make our decisions on these picks, and it's a much lower entry fee at 5,000 gold or 750 gems, so kind of the best like entry-level draft format on Arena. With that whole introduction out of the way, let's just get into the draft. And the pick one, pack one is going to be very simple here. The Eternal Wanderer is one of the strongest cards in the entire format, a bomb rare planeswalker that can board wipe in your favor with the minus four ability, or spit out multiple double strikers with the zero, or lock down some of your opponent's creatures with the plus one or flicker your own creatures with the plus one just a really flexible incredibly powerful planeswalker that can win games that you had no business winning so easily the pack one pick one there for pack one pick two we have an ossification which is going to be a really solid follow-up to the eternal wanderer this is a great cheap removal spell in white it's very efficient two mana to exile anything until this leaves the battlefield so unless your opponent is running main deck enchantment removal this is pretty much permanent removal. So pick three, we have some decent other options in Uncommon, including Nimrazor Paladin and Cacophony Scamp. We also have Charforger, but that would be a black-red card when we're two cards deep into white. We also just have a very solid on-color common. The Duelist of Deep Faith is a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two Toxic 1 with First Strike during your turn. Pretty great 2-drop, and you do want to make sure you have plenty of 2-mana creatures in this format. This also keeps us on color and we can just choose what secondary color we're playing later on during the draft. So I'm pretty happy to just take Duelist of Deep Faith over Nimrazor Paladin being the probably the largest competition in this pack. Not much else is super good in here. For pick four, we have some very solid options. One of my favorite being the Crawling Chorus as a one mana way to start getting some toxic onto your opponent, some poison onto them. Also two bodies off of one card, and it's a premium one-drop creature. The format is definitely aggressive enough where you do get a pretty big advantage from being able to play a one-mana creature into a two-mana creature into a three-mana creature to start the game and just curving out. So big fan of Crawling Chorus, probably what I'm going to take here. The other option that it's really competing with is Atraxa's Skitterfang, being a very flexible, pretty powerful card that can give our creatures whatever ability we need between those options, and it can fit into any deck. That being said, there's not much advantage being given to us by taking the colorless card here because the Crawling Chorus is also a card that's going to fit into this deck no matter what because three cards deep, including Eternal Water and Ossification, is pretty much locking us into white no matter what. So taking a white card is on par with taking a colorless card in terms of flexibility throughout the draft. So I'm just going to take the Crawling Chorus, focus up a bit on Toxic here. And looks like Rebooting Arena did solve the double-clicking problem. So that is nice. Now I can actually highlight my picks before I slam dunk them. Another pick here where we can pretty easily just stay open and take the Jawbone Duelist, another premium 2-drop creature in white for the Toxic decks. It is competing with Incubation Sack, which is a very good value play for green decks. You get to get three 3-3s three off of this card over time at minimum. If you have any Proliferate, you can get even more off of it, which is quite nice. But uh, we're pretty heavy into white here and definitely have a good toxic theme going. So taking another powerful toxic card like Jawbone Duelist is just going to 100% make the cut and uh, improve our deck a good bit. So Jawbone Duelist feels like an excellent pickup here. And since we are in mono white, we are open to whatever we want as the secondary color. And the strongest card in this pack by far is the Bladehold War Whip. One a red and a white for a 2-2 two -two double striker, and this equipment can then be moved onto other creatures after that 2-2 uh, two -two rebel dies. So very, very good play. Very powerful card. One of the best of the gold uncommons in the format. And uh, we're pretty happy to have been open enough to now push into the potential red-white equipment deck here. Pick 7 doesn't really have any premium cards in it. Mesmerizing Dose would be the closest, but that's only if we're pretty heavy into blue with that double blue casting cost there so there's like a pretty solid blue removal spell an okay black one nothing much on color we'll just go ahead and scoop up the fair basilica i'm not very excited to play these lands in this format because it is so aggressive where you're trying to curve out with your early creatures so you can definitely get punished for running tap lands but i think still running one copy um, 
of each of your colors of sacrifice land can still be pretty good value especially when you have really powerful cards in your deck like the eternal wanderer to try to dig towards late game that can uh, that can help flip the board state in your favor no matter what's going on so when you're on the back foot being able to just start sacrificing your lands and digging for that eternal wanderer can be nice so we'll just go fair basilica here not too much else competing with it Pack 1, pick 8, we see one of red's best commons, and it's very good for the red-white equipment deck, and really just any red deck in general. Another 2-mana creature, which is really important to have on curve, basically a 2-mana 3-1, and it gives us that equipment that we can start moving around elsewhere, so huge fan of Barbed Batterfist. Very happy to take it here. Here for pick 9, we do have a Shrapnel Slinger if I really want more 2-drops, but we're pretty early in the draft and we already have 3 2-mana creatures that are just better, so hopefully we can just keep that quality of creature up in the 2-mana slot where we won't need a slightly more filler creature like the Shrapnel Slinger. So the main competition here is between Hazardous Blast and the Autonomous Furnace. These are both fine cards to run one of in pretty much any deck. I think I would rather... Just scoop up the Hazardous Blast here. There's a lot of one toughness stuff in the format that this can kill, so this will often kill at least one thing when you play it. And if the game becomes a board stall, it will win you the game out of nowhere. So this is a card that has performed really, really well in this format. Because again, it's just really good against decks like ours. We have the Chorus and the Might that die to it, the Duelist dies to it, the Batter Fist dies to it. A lot of stuff just randomly dies to this card, and it has that secondary ability potentially winning you the game out of nowhere so we'll grab our one copy of hazardous blast there not a huge fan of any of the cards left here i'll probably go with a dune mover as the most flexible card we do have a good bit of toxic creatures so having a little more a little more of that might be helpful and this could help us with mana fixing whatever colors we end up not the greatest card ever it is a one toughness creature which we've just gone over one of the reasons that can be a pretty bad deal but uh, the other cards here aren't great only two toughness for three mana is pretty bad trading down into two drops so i'm not a fan of centurion thrill of possibility just not affecting the board and just being a very late game kind of draw spell hasn't played very well and resistance reunited is kind of just weaker than the common combat tricks in white uh, for our deck we already have three toxic creatures and in white there's a common combat trick that's two mana to give plus two plus two and if you're targeting a toxic creature you get to draw a card so that generally plays better than this even in the red white equipment archetype even the way our deck's looking so i'll just take dune mover here not super happy about it but we are on pick 10 pick 11 these are all going to be a lot of cards that might not make the cut for pick 11 i'm gonna go for something that's just cute uh, just taking one of these combat tricks might be better, especially like Blazing Crescendo, which is a combat trick that also draws you a card. But Cacophony Scamp is just really, really cute with Batter Fist. So it's a 1-mana one 1-1. One, one. When it dies, you deal 1 damage. Well, you deal damage equal to its power to any target. So it does hit the board on turn 1, does that thing that you want where you can curve out with your 1-mana creature into 2-mana creature and so on. So it helps in that front, and it trades up into 2 Toughness creatures, so not really that bad by itself. The thing that's really cute about it, though, that makes me want to pick it up is that it's very funny with the barbed batter fist because you can put the batter fist on it, giving it plus one, minus one, and uh, killing it in the process, letting you shoot anything for two damage. So really cute little combo there. It's kind of fun. More cute than anything. Probably not the greatest thing ever, but I'm going to take it over these uh, replacement level combat tricks. I think they're both solid combat tricks, but we don't need a ton of those. And this will be a pretty easy furnace strider. We don't have any five mana creatures yet, and this is a very good one to have at the top end of your curve coming out hasting in for some damage and giving your next creature haste so take that furnace strider be pretty happy with it now a molten rebuke if we end up low on removal we can play this ideally we have a lot of cheaper more instant speed kind of removal like hex gold slashes and such but if we can't find any others we can play molten rebuke and here is a premium removal spell to pick up pack two pick one the annex sentry Three mana for a 1-4 with Toxic 1 when it enters the battlefield, exile an artifact or creature an opponent controls with mana value 3 or less until it leaves the battlefield. So obviously the thing that's not ideal about this is it's temporary removal. Eventually your opponent can probably just blow up the Annex Sentry and get their card back. This is such a huge tempo swing in the early game. In an aggressive format like this, this card is pretty busted. You get to put a nice Toxic Attacker on the board while removing one of their blockers and just kind of go to town from there. So we're very happy to take Annex Sentry. I would love to wheel Plated Onslaught. I think this is just pretty great in the red, white, and white, blue 
aggressive archetypes because we tend to have a lot of um, equipment adding to that affinity for artifacts and potentially even some artifact creatures. So this can be a huge, uh, huge game ender in white aggro decks. So that'd be a nice wheel. If not that, then one of these commons with four Mirrodin would be solid as well. And for pack two, pick two, we have a lot of pretty great options, but I think I'm going to go with Bladehold War Whip. I'm not confident in the way that the bots draft yet to know if they're going to let this wheel, to know if one of them isn't just going to randomly take this. And this is just the strongest card for our deck, so I'm going to take it here. If this were a player draft, there'd be a slight argument for being like, well, it'll probably wheel. We're probably the only one in red-white after how pack one went. But somebody might like switch colors for this. Uh, and then we have some issues. This is just the best inclusion to our deck by a little bit, so I am going to take it here. That being said, other cards that are probably not going to wheel that would be pretty powerful in our deck are Indoctrination Attendant being the best one, because we get to pick up one of our equipment, recast it, and get another creature off of it. But there's also that Flensing Raptor. With the amount of cheap toxic creatures we have in our deck, this should be pretty powerful, giving one of them flying and some additional power when we play this. And Incisor Glider, again, with the amount of cheap white toxic creatures we have, we can potentially corrupt our opponent and then use this to buff our whole board, which is pretty absurd. So we're going to take the Bladehold War Whip, but I'd be very happy to wheel Attendant, Raptor, or Incisor Glider. And for pack 2, pick 3, we get another pretty premium inclusion to the deck, and it's a 1-drop, which helps us curve out 1, 2, and 3 mana cards. Swooping Lookout plays very well in this archetype, because this is a card that's very good at picking up equipment. 1-mana, one 1-2 one, Flying Vigilance just gets on the board, starts chipping away at your opponent, and kind of annoys them if they have any 1-mana, one 1-1s one like Crawling Chorus. They can't really attack into it. But yeah, this is just very good at picking up equipment. We can put a Barb Batter Fist on this, and all of a sudden it's a 2-1 Flying Vigilance, that chips in for a good amount of damage every single turn, and obviously the more equipment, the merrier later in the game. So we'll take a look out here. Other great additions would be probably Axiom Engraver, just a great two-drop that lets us filter through land draws later in the game to find more gas, find more cards we actually need to play. But Bardish is also fine at five mana. Nice just equipment to move around for the archetype, but we're going to go for Lookout. Again, the one two-mana plays kind of at a premium in the format. Pack 2, pick 4, we actually have a lot of options here. We have the two 3-mana Menace creatures between Bladegraft Aspirant and Furnace Punisher, which is actually a super close pick between those two, because while the Aspirant does make our equipment cheaper and make our equipment that target the Aspirant cheaper to use, um, I haven't found that's super necessary to be getting value off of your 4 Mirrodin equipment, so even in the red-white archetype, I don't find this card to be that necessary, even though that's clearly what it's meant for. So I've even picked Furnace Punisher over Aspirant before in, uh, in decks like this where we currently have, what, like three equipment? And we're not like that excited about uh, reducing the cost. They're already just so cheap and we're probably just playing them turn two, turn three before we play the Aspirant. So I'm not massively high on that card where, yeah, I've picked Punisher over it before, but we have some other options as well. Duelist of Deep Faith for just another premium two drop toxic creature and Complete Devotion as a combat trick for all of our toxic cards. There's even Gold Warden's Helm for another 4 Mirrodin equipment. Honestly, I think all five of these cards are super reasonable picks, but I think I'm just going to take another premium 2-drop creature and grab the Duelist of Deep Faith here. Get curving out. We already have three very good 3-mana cards. Let's grab our, uh, our third, I guess our fourth great 2-mana card. We're looking to try to cut Dune Mover at this rate. All right, speaking of premium two mana cards, this is a pretty easy barbed batter fist. The very nice equipment comes with a 3-1 for only two mana, and then just move it around later for uh, for a good deal. Lightbringer, another card that's very clearly for this archetype, but I haven't been super impressed by. It's only getting plus one, plus one, even if you slap like three different equipments on it. It just gets that static plus one, plus one stat boost, which isn't the largest. I think I would just prefer other creatures that have better base stat lines then the 3-2 three, for 3. Anointer obviously doesn't work for our archetype, we just don't have anything that comes with oil counters right now, but that is a premium card for red-green and red-blue. So yeah, pretty easy barbed batterfist. Pack 2, pick 6, now we have a pretty easy Hex Gold Slash, a very efficient removal spell. In red, it's instant speed, 
If we're playing against any toxic creatures, it does four damage to them. So sometimes you spend one mana to kill your opponent's five mana toxic creature, like the five mana four four with toxic in green, the five mana four four with toxic in black. Card is pretty nuts. It's obviously very good against like Annex Sentry as well, just one mana to kill the three drop toxic creature. This card is super insane and we're very happy to take it. A little sad we have to take it over Resistance Skywarden, which is another card that's just very good at the top end of the curve, a 5-5 five, five Menace Reach, but the premium cheap removal uh, is super, super premium in the format, and we're going to take it here. Pretty close pick here, pack 2, pick 7, between Bladecraft Aspirant and Mirrodin Bardish. I think I'm just going to go for the cheaper card that's pretty good at wielding equipment just because of its evasiveness. Again, I don't care about the additional effects on this too much, it's mostly just the 3 mana 2-3 stats, but the additional effects do give it the slight edge over the Bardiche, so we'll take Aspirant here at 3 mana. Pack 2, pick 8. Again, I don't love running multiple copies of Hazardous Blast, so we can just go for Mandible Justicia here. Nice 2-drop for this kind of deck where we do have a lot of artifacts just by having a lot of equipments to give this that buff, get some extra damage in with it. And we're definitely not an archetype that can use Awaken the Sleeper, I wouldn't really run this card unless you have a good amount of ways to sacrifice whatever creature you're stealing, which isn't really a thing in red-white. We did wheel the Plated Onslaught, which is a very nice aggressive finisher for this kind of deck, so I will happily run a copy of that card, taking it over Gold Warden's Helm and a second copy of Hazardous Blast, but yeah, Plated Onslaught can end some games very quickly. Now we have Sinu Dancer, which is fine when we have a good amount of toxic creatures like we do in the white half of our deck. We really want to be able to use this for only one mana, so this might be one of our first cuts if we don't end up with a massively high toxic count. But it's definitely better than Hazardous Blast Copy 2, probably better than Free from Flesh, because again, there's just better combat tricks we could be picking up. Another Molten Rebuke has some filler. And there is the Complete Devotion wheeling all the way through the pack if we want this combat trick. That is pretty sweet, but so is Bladecraft Aspirants and Gold Warden's Helm. I think we'll take a look at the curve here. We do have four very good three mana creatures right now. So I think I'll actually take the combat trick over a fifth three mana creature currently. Because if I end up getting any more premium ones, like a third Blade Hold War Whip, we're going to be really clumped up at three mana in the next pack. So we'll take a combat trick here. And wrapping up the pack, we now have another combat trick versus Gleeful Demolition. I do like the idea of Gleeful Demolition being able to blow up an opposing artifact in the right matchup, and always having the backup plan of just blowing up one of our batter fists and making some goblins. I'll go for that, but Conviction's also fine. I think either of these are probably gonna be one of our first cuts. Uh, I'm gonna just cut this Dune Mover right now though, because I've got plenty of two drops without it at this point. And then we'll slop, we'll slap the Offer Immortality into the sideboard. Pack 3, pick 1. A few of these cards are really competing here. We have the Skitterfang and the Punisher as very good 3 drops. Probably would go for the Skitterfang over the Punisher for this deck. Although, Punisher does wield equipment pretty well. That being said, they are competing with a very good 4 drop. And we have 0 4 mana creatures in the deck right now. So in the interest of, again... Filling out that curve, being able to potentially curve out and use all of our mana turn 1 all the way up into turn 4. I am going to go for the Chimney Rabble here. Card plays very well in the format, being an aggressive attacker that leaves behind something to block with. So it plays the offensive and the defensive well. And obviously two creatures means more targets for all of your equipment to start suiting up later in the game. So pretty happy to take Chimney Rabble, although I would love to see one of these cards wheel. We can take one of those as well. For pack 3, pick 2, we have a very similar pick where we have really solid stuff at 3 mana and a good 2 drop as well. But we have, again, that Chimney Rabble filling out our 4 mana creature slot, topping off our curve pretty well, and also giving us 2 bodies for our Plated Onslaught to give more creatures plus 2 plus 1 and really finish our opponents. So pretty high on Chimney Rabble for this deck. We'll take the second copy here and hope to maybe wheel one of these three cards. Pack 3, pick 3. We have a premium 1-drop creature, the Fusling, a 1-mana one 1-1 one one Trample, but it keeps getting bigger every time a creature and artifact we control is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, so eventually hits for a million later. 
We also have the premium cheap removal of Hex Gold Slash, and the other card competing here is the Indoctrination Attendant to pick up those equipment. So I do want to make a quick look at the deck here, take a quick look at the curve, and see how powerful our non-creature cards are looking right now, because that can really decide if we want more premium creatures or if we just need more premium removal here. So looking at the deck, I think our creature quality right now is pretty incredible. We have some very good two drops like Batterfists, Duelists, some great one drops like the Lookout, the Crawling Chorus, the Cacophony Scamp, and then at three mana, double War Whip, Annex Sentry being premium, two Chimney Rebels at four mana, Furnace Strider at five, some really, really good stuff going on in the creature curve, four equipment in the deck, so that means 17 creatures, so we're basically good on creatures. Although, again, Attendant and Fuseling would let us cut a weaker card like Sinu Dancer to replace. But how good are we doing on non-creatures? So if I cut Fair Basilica, we're at 26 cards. We're probably playing 16 lands here, maybe 17 since we do want to make it to 6 mana for the Eternal Wanderer. But if we're playing 16 lands, then that would mean that we're playing 24 non-land cards, so I get to cut two of my non-creature non-lands. Probably cut Demolition at this point. And probably one of the Rebukes. Maybe cut Double Rebuke here. And then we're running Gleeful Demolition, Hex Gold Slash, Complete Devotion, Ossification, Hazardous Blast, and Onslaught. I'm not a massive fan of that non-creature slot here. Like, the creature curve, I think we have very little filler. We have, like, Aspirant, maybe not the greatest, and Sinu Dancer, maybe not the greatest. Um, Sinu Dancer is really the most filler creature. Aspirant is still pretty good in here. Uh, maybe just dish here, just for the low toughness isn't awesome. But everything else going on in our creature curve is great. But for non-creatures, that Gleeful Demolition doesn't look awesome. We have one, two, three, four five toxic creatures so complete devotion might not even be the greatest and then i also actually don't love hazardous blast in this archetype kind of like a 23rd inclusion to me these other three i'm definitely happy with but these not the greatest so just upping the quality of our non-creatures feels more premium to me here and i'll take a hex gold slash to fit that narrative we'll cut the demolition and throw a second slash in here for pack 3, pick 4, we have Crawling Chorus, which is two bodies in one. I'm not in love with Charge of the Mites unless I really, really care about the Phyrexian Mites, which I don't think we do in this deck. Another Furnace Strider for another 5-drop would be fine. I think I'll probably take a Crawling Chorus here and cut the Sinu Dancer. Or I could just take a Furnace Strider, cut the Sinu Dancer, and go for a 17 land build. A little higher up on the curve. That seems fine, too. We do have a lot of 3s even without a second Chorus. I'll actually go for a second Furnace Strider as another finisher. I don't think we're going to care too much about Toxic. We didn't end up getting much Corrupted stuff, and I am pretty heavily considering cutting the Complete Devotion at this point. So we'll take the Furnace Strider then, drop the Sinu Dancer. Although the Incisor Glider here is the card that would have really made me want the Chorus. If we were going to wheel some Incisor Gliders and get some of these, I would actually be pretty happy with two or three Crawling Chorus, and then we cut like the Mandible Justiciar at two mana for more incisor gliders. I think I'm still gonna take this card because our deck does go pretty wide and we still have a few toxic creatures for sure. We can corrupt our opponent now and then. So I think it's got more potential upside than just this year. And the only other card it's competing with is engraver, which is fine. Uh, but I like the potential play of incisor glider when our opponent is corrupted, that could be quite powerful. Nothing much here, we'll just take the random combat trick, I guess. Pick seven, there's also nothing much. There's the Lightbringer that's not going to make the cut. Thrill of Possibility and Skull Bomb won't either. Uh, let's just take a Lightbringer. Uh, Volshock Splitter is fine in this deck. Against All Odds is also fine in this deck. I actually do have a lot of fun with this card in this archetype. The idea is you have a really aggressive curve in one of one and two mana creatures like we do here. And then we're just happy to trade off one of those creatures... And then whenever we draw this, we pick up our one or two mana creature from our graveyard and flicker one of our equipment to get another creature out of it. So I think I'll play it here. I think it's pretty fun. More fun than the splitter. We'll try it out for sure. In this deck, run that over the complete devotion, I think. 
Uh, another combat trick, take a Zealot's Devotion. Another Incisor Glider could be good. We'll see. Super late Fusling, we'll definitely play that. Wow. Super late Crawling Chorus to make the Incisor Gliders easier to trigger. And we actually have to make some choices how we want to build this deck now. We can go for the Incisor Glider Corrupting stuff, or we could just completely drop off of the Toxic theme, because now we have enough just premium non-Toxic cards like Fusling that we could just cut most of our Toxic creatures and, and drop that whole idea. So let me check the sideboard again real quick. See if there's any Toxic creatures up here still. Whoa, how did Annex Sentry get up there? I guess Dune Mover is the only Toxic creature we're not playing right now. So for Toxic stuff, to try to corrupt our opponent, we have two Crawling Chorus, two Duelist of Deep Faith, a Drawbone Duelist, and an Annex Sentry, uh, and a Dune Mover. Seven Toxic creatures? It's going to be a little inconsistent, and we have to run some weaker cards like Dune Mover to do it. I think... I would rather just be on the complete non-toxic strategy, so our deck is just more consistent in general. And just kind of give up on that. We don't have to play cards like Dune Mover here. I don't even think Duelist looks great in this deck, because it's good with combat tricks or equipment that add to its power, but none of our equipment are actually good with this. Batterfist will just kill it, and War Whip will just give it double double strike. Not that high on that. I think I'd rather just have Duelists because they can pick up the Batterfists well. Yeah, I think we're kind of dropping that Toxic theme, so we drop the Incisor Gliders as well. Um, plenty of creatures here, which is nice. Could even drop the Crawling Courses. We still have three one-mana cards, and I think they all just synergize better. Right, like Fusling's just going to keep getting bigger as the game goes on. Cacophony's Camp works great with the Batter Fist, and Swooping Lookout works great with the Batter Fists as well. We also have Cheap Removal there, and at 2 mana we have 6 creatures, 2 Duelists, a Justicier, an Engraver, and Double Batter Fist, and then again, more efficient removal with Ossification. Yeah, I think the deck just looks great without the Choruses now. We're kind of just completely dropping that potential Toxic theme. And then now we just cut... The 17th land, or like a Hazardous Blast, or an Against All Odds or something here. How many artifacts do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is that it? Do any of these make mites? Seven still feels like enough for Plated Onslaught, though, because... Even if this costs 4 mana, that's reasonable. 3 mana or less is where it's really good. And by the time we're casting this, we've usually done everything else we want to do. Fills a pretty similar role as Hazardous Blast if my opponent doesn't have 1 Toughness Creatures. Like, if my opponent has 1 Toughness Creatures, then yeah, Hazardous Blast gets in there, shoots some of those creatures, and, and lets us get a lot of damage in. Plated Onslaught does very, very similar in where it's just going to get a bunch of damage in on a late game turn, try to find lethal. I think I'd rather just be on Onslaught over Blast here with the double rabble. Some nice go wide stuff going on. Yeah, we'll go Onslaught over Blast. Keep the against all odds because it's very fun. Potentially pretty good. The archetype. And we will go for the 17 land build. Make it more consistent to curve all the way up to 5 for Furnace Striders. And so we'll always be able to cast the Eternal Wonder when we draw her. All right, here's a look at the complete deck we'll be playing today in our Phyrexia All Will Be One Quick Draft. It is a Boros Equipment deck, a red-white equipment deck, very aggressive curve, some great one-drops that are pretty good at playing around with our equipment, especially Batterfist on Lookout or Scamp, pretty spicy. Fuseling just kind of turns into a fireball, just gets bigger as our stuff keeps dying and eventually just slams in for a big amount of trample damage later, and it's a pretty nasty fireball if we end up putting... A blade hold war whip on it for double strike trample uh, there's the axiom engraver to filter through any land draws later and a ton of aggressive two drops like double duelist of deep faith mandible justicier and double batter fist great cheap removal with double hex gold slash and ossification 
Kind of just all the stuff you want in your aggressive decks. Tons of great cheap aggressive creatures, evasive ones as well, cheap removal like the Hex Cold Slashes, the Ossification, and the Annex Sentry. And then at three mana onward is where we start getting our finishers. Stuff like the Blade Hold War Whips as double strikers that then move the double strike around to other threats. Uh, Chimney Rabble pressing in for damage and giving us another creature. Furnace Strider pushing in for damage as well, uh, potentially finishing our opponent off. And then the two really big finishers, the Plated Onslaught to buff the whole board and find lethal, and the Eternal Wanderer, just one of the biggest bombs in the whole format. So that's the deck we're going to be playing today. Very excited to see how it does as we head into the gameplay. All right, here we are on the play in game one. We have turn two Batterfist into turn three Aspirant into turn three Rabble if I hit a land, so very nice starting curve. No reason to mulligan this hand. A definite keep. Hopefully it does as spicy things as it looks like it can do. One of the really fun synergies here is that after we hit them with the Batterfist, we can then start moving it over for zero mana onto the Aspirant. So we have a 3-2 menace instead of a 2-3 menace. If the board state is in a position where that's going to be good. Here's our turn two Batterfist. We're super happy with that. And the curve continues. If we hit our land drops, we get to play something all the way up until turn five with the Furnace Strider as our next draw. There's a Blight Belly Rat from our opponent. Be pretty okay trading my 2-2 Rebel into that. I think I'd rather do that than trade my Hex Gold Slash, so we'll send in the 3-1. No trade. We'll play the Aspirant then, and I will not move the equipment over yet. That way I'm threatening to block their 2-2 with a 2-3. If I move the Batter Fist now, I can't move it back off the Aspirant immediately. And then I've got a 2 Toughness creature against their 2-2. So this could get them to not attack if they don't have a combat trick. If they do attack, I'm not going to make the block here. I just want to be able to threaten to block. All right, and if they have the removal spell, then obviously we'll also not block. Maze Skull Bomb as well. So we get hit for three and one poison counter from the Blight Belly Rat. This is a toxic threat, and it proliferates when it dies to put another counter on us. So we're just going to curve out here, play the Rabble, then play the Strider and try to keep the pressure on. We are on the play. So we get a nice aggressive lead this game, even through that removal spell. They're already down to 11 damage thanks to the haste from that chimney rabble. Alright, Chittering Skitterling from our opponent. Moderately annoying blocker, does not have toxic so we can't kill it with the slash. I do have the mana to play Onslaught here. If I shoot the rat, attack with everybody, they can block Rabble with Skitterling and take 5, 6, 7, 8. A lot of damage. Also still just play Furnace Strider. They don't have enough power to kill that. Attack in... What, Rabble and Furnace Strider? They can double block and kill Rabble, but I kill the rat. They take 4, then we kill them with Onslaught next turn. I feel like Slash Onslaught looks good enough to me to, while probably not kill them this turn, uh, pretty much guaranteed lethal from Furnace Strider coming in with haste next turn, so we'll go for that here. And we kill the Skitterling off of this block, put them down to three against this board state and another haste creature. Feels unlikely they can find a way to survive, especially because they did miss a land drop last turn, so the most mana they could have here is four if they top decked a land. Alright, they do have a land drop this turn. Anything they could do for four mana to survive here? There's a mere convert. Convert plus a two mana removal spell like Anoint with Affliction would keep them alive on board, but the Furnace Strider would still find the kill. Hanex Sentry would also do so, although if they have Anoint with Affliction, they can exile the Sentry and get their Convert back immediately, so I'd rather just play the Furnace Strider. I think this kills them through more cards than the Annex Sentry does. Again, because their biggest way to potentially survive here is just the two mana Anoint with Affliction to exile one of our creatures. And it is going to be the victory there, so we are 1-0 to start this draft off. Here we are on the play again for game two. Feels pretty great. Turn two Batterfist into turn three Aspirant again. 
with the cheap removal to back them up. Definitely the plan here. Alright. We will drop our batter fist and pass the turn. Opponent is on white green here. Could be white green toxic. Luckily for us, no plays. Turn one or turn two. Means we are gonna curve out very aggressively. Still not gonna move the Batterfist onto the Aspirant until uh, I know that I want to, because it's more expensive to move it back. Yeah, so if something like this happened and I want this to be a 3 1 again, I'd have to spend one mana to move the Batterfist back onto it. Um, that being said, I could pretty easily do that here. I've got plenty of mana and it's only gonna cost one to slash the sentry, which I think is the play here. I think we'd rather slash the sentry and save the ossification for something potentially bigger. Send in for three and pass the turn. There's an orthodoxy enforcer, we'll ossify that. Or I could just start chipping in with Aspirant, but I think just hit for five feels good. We definitely need to draw something non-land eventually this game. To find lethal. So I doubt our opponent is just on five lands after the Enforcer. You know, I might need to hit non-lands badly enough to just start chipping in with the Aspirant and not use the Ossification. So I still have this for if they play something bigger. And I am still pushing in for damage here, even if it is less. Silica Shepherd. Well, that does make the Enforcer a 4-4. Luckily, those Mites can't block, so that's good for us. But at least that is going on. But I think we have to just ossify the Enforcer now. I did draw a Fusling, so at least we have another creature. I can move the Batter Fist to my 2-2 two -two and offer the trade with the Shepherd. We play the Fusling first, so if they do trade the Shepherd into my 3-1, we get another oil counter on the Exuberant Fusling. And we are going to get the trade here, so Fusling gets a little bit bigger, which is nice. We're definitely not putting the Batterfist on the Fusling, and it's free to put it on the Aspirant, so I'll just leave it unequipped for now. Keep the Aspirant at 3 toughness, just in case they have another kind of fight spell or something. That gives uh, plus one, plus two in fights. Then they wouldn't have anything big enough to kill the Aspirant right now. Alright, they can double block Aspirant next turn now. With those two. So we suit up the Aspirants. Send in for three. We only kill one of their two creatures if we do that. Kind of have to just pass. Yeah, we just need to draw into kind of anything here. Not going to put Batterfist on Aspirant still because I'm not going to be blocking Basilisk here. Just keep it at the higher toughness. More defensive. If I put Batterfist on Aspirant, I can't take it off because the only other creature I have is the Fusling, which I would kill if I move the Batterfist to that. All right. Do I have to just trade into the Justiciar here? Keep them from gaining more life? Feels a little like it. They could have the plus two plus two draw card combat trick. Be pretty horrible for me. If they had that, they would attack with Basilisk as well, unless they're playing it really defensively. This might just be trying to get a little bit of Toxic in here. Yeah, just trying to get a little bit of Toxic in, get us corrupted. So we do get a kill on one of those. Oh dear. Well, not really gonna beat a Phyrexian Vindicator, unfortunately. Shoots any target whenever it's dealt damage. Also a 5-5 flyer. 
Um, I can slash the basilisk. Doesn't really accomplish anything still. And just pass the turn here. We do still have one out. If we draw the Eternal Wanderer in the next turn, or maybe two, we can still win this game, but that's about it. Charge the Mites. All right, Aspirant is definitely dead. It's four damage. I think I need to stop as much damage as possible, kill the Convert instead of the Basilisk. Chimney Rabble. Actually not horrible here, but I can't actually attack with it, which is rough. I play a 3-3 three, three, and a 1-1. One, one. I have to be able to block everything but the Vindicator or I die. So I have to play the Rabble and pass. 3-3 three, three for Basilisk, 1-1 one, one for the Might. removal there. Particularly the Wanderer. I don't think we have any removal that can kill the Vindicator left at this point. Alright. Unfortunate. Drew a little bit too many lands and ran up into a pretty deadly card there, so that is going to be one and one as we head into game three. One minor change to the deck real quick before we head into round three. Did go ahead and cut a land for that hazardous blast. We're going to go for the 16 land version because we do still have a pretty low curve on everything we're doing outside of that Eternal Wander. And that's a powerful enough card that if we draw it early and have to wait a while to hit the sixth mana, that'll be fine. We do need to try a little harder to prevent flood a tiny bit here. Cutting one land again, not going to change the ratio of lands to non-lands too much, just cutting one land here, but I think it's probably a bit better. Have a Hazardous Blast over the 17th land for this build. All right, we've got a turn two Duelist of Deep Faith here, Hex Gold Slash to hold up, and some Striders late game. Keep this hand, we definitely need to hit some lands or some cheap spells. But that's most of what our deck contains, one or the other. Turn one Terramorphic Expanse from our opponent is going to grab them an island. We do draw a cheap spell, a swooping lookout here. A little awkward to draw on turn two, but we're still happy to have something else to play in the coming turns. Our opponent will start with a Mandible Justice here. We do draw into the Eternal Water. Now we really need to hit some lands. Send in our first striking Duelist of Deep Faith here. Rather not have to Hazardous Blast this just this year, or Hex Gold Slash this just this year, because it will die to Hazardous Blast later. But if we miss any more land drops, we might come to that point. Especially after drawing the most expensive card in our deck last turn. Yeah, I mean, if I just make sure I survive till six mana. Should have a pretty good shot this game, so I'm just gonna take that one for one removal on just this year. Keep that off our face, and good thing I did, because we would not be doing anything here still. Probably go look out for Batterfist trade. Or look out for the Rebel token. They'll still have the Batterfist around to put on other cards. We are having one of those classic games of just kind of how it always feels when you're bouncing between a 17 and 16 land deck, where when you run the 17, you flood out, you run the 16, and you just don't draw enough lands. I could have a rough time here, because statistically speaking, the difference between the percentage of lands you draw with a 16 land deck and a 17 land deck is not that high, but it always feels like a huge change when you do it. 
Sometimes it just feels like you get punished either way. We do finally hit the third land, at least. I believe we're still sending the duelist in because it's just a way better attacker than blocker. We are still at 18 and we're going to have two other blockers to hold off their other creatures. We're going to go down to 12 and we'll drop an aspirant. We hit another land next turn. Hazardous Blast is going to be premium on this board state. It's going to kill two of their cards, three of their cards. If we can hit the Hazardous Blast mana, that should be pretty, uh, pretty destabilizing for our opponent. Completely kind of stop their aggro. Take the three here. They are going to Hex Gold Slash our Duelist of Deep Faith. Move a Batterfist to the other Rebel. Move the Batterfist to the other Rebel. Fair enough. We do not hit the Hazardous Blast. I can play a Batterfist buff up the lookout here. Feels like our best line. I'm still holding three blockers up and hitting a little harder. Hoth Fire of Resistance. I need the land immediately, or Koth is going to take over this game. Koth is six loyalty, so we can kill Koth on the crackback if we leave all our creatures on board. And we do hit the land, so we Hazardous Blast. This kills all their creatures and stops the rest from blocking. We then hit Koth for six, and that should just lock the game in our favor here. And is down to a single 2 2. We'll never stop fighting. Found the fourth land right on time there. Here's a Mirren Bardiche for our opponents and a Surgical Skull Bomb. That's very good at killing tokens. You can go ahead and kill our Rebel token. Definitely take the two. I'm going to keep getting in with this lookout. But we'll hold the rest of our creatures back to stay alive. Seventh land from our opponent. They can put a batter fist on something here with their final mana. And they will put it on their 2 2, making that a 3 1. We do hit the fifth mana, so we get to drop a furnace strider and have quite a large blocker. Opponents at 10. If I haste out a furnace strider, I'm threatening 10 damage. They have to block something, but they could just block the 2 2. They only crack back for 7, though, so it might be worth it, especially with a second furnace strider. To play. I think we just try to find lethal in two swings. Like, unless our opponent top decks something very powerful, should kill them in two attacks. So they get to kill our 2 2 and take 8, or they have to chump block Furnace Strider. And take 8 is the choice. They are dead to a swooping lookout or a blade graft aspirant hitting them, and those are both evasive in different ways. One of them is flying, the other one is menace. Skull Bomb is a sorcery speed ability to put one of our cards back in hand. They'll probably have to just bounce the Swooping Lookout, but they're just going to scoop them up here. They don't find another creature or anything to block with, and that will be the victory there. Two and one, heading into round number four. Here we are in round four with an unfortunately unkeepable hand. Obviously, if I make it to six mana and double white, Eternal Wanderer can do some nasty stuff, but it's an aggressive enough format that playing a single 1-1 one -one and then doing nothing till potentially turn 5 is, uh, is a little bit risky. Honestly, any draft format is aggressive enough that this is, uh, this is a risky keep, but especially in this set, this has got to be a mulligan, unfortunately. Alright, this is significantly better. Scamp into Duelist into War Whip. We might even put the Wanderer on bottom. Don't love that. I mean, just turn 2 Duelist, turn 3 War Whip is still a very good start to the game, so I think I'll actually just put Scamp on bottom here. But I could see a very good argument for just dumping the Wanderer on bottom and taking the 1, 2, 3 curve. Pestilent Siphoner will start things for our opponent, so looking like another matchup where our 1 damage to everything spell is going to play pretty well. 
There's a Ruthless Predation to kill our Duelist, and they'll hit us for two damage and one poison counter. Well, time to drop our Blade Hold War Whip and see if they have an additional removal spell. Not quite gonna ossify the Pestilent Siphoner. We'll take a poison for a little bit here. Vraska's Fall, super nasty. We're immediately corrupted now. They kill our 2-2, put another poison counter on us when they cast that, and they'll be putting another poison counter on us when that hits us, so we are corrupted. Do I wait for the Eternal Wanderer here? Or do I just ossify the Siphoner? I think I'm still just going to keep taking one poison every turn for now. Fourth poison. Viral spawning. Okay, well, we'll ossify that. And then we know we can wander the turn after this. This is a really bad spot, though. Even with an Eternal Wanderer coming up. Exile up to one target artifact or creature return of the battlefield at the beginning of the player's next end step. So this can do tokens. This can just kill tokens. I guess I'm dying to poison faster than I'm dying to combat damage anyway, so I might as well exile the flyer then because the wanderer can kill tokens. Another viral spawning. Now we can play the wanderer plus one to kill one of their tokens. The other token can hit the wanderer, but she'll still be six loyalty total, so take three here. They have the combat trick they can fully kill her. This is just my best play by a lot. And we all leave with our lives. Have a nice trip. Vraska's Fall. Copy number two. Absolutely demolished by Vraska's Fall. Well, that is magic, baby. Probably have the combat trick here as well. Sure do. Eight poison now. Swooping lookout's not gonna get there. It can block mere convert and we'll go to nine poison. We're dead to a proliferate. Opponent just with the perfect suite of removal this game is going to close it out here. Shoot the head cleaver and chump the token now. Technically still in it for another turn. Can't exile a four mana value creature. Can't exile the nurse. I guess it's better to exile the token anyway. Uh, we're out of ways to discard a card and draw a card, so we just slam down the land. All right, and they'll get us there. Opponent just on all breaks. They're all gas, no brakes. I was about to say all brakes, no gas. No, all, all gas, no brakes there. They were on just three lands, all gas for way too long. And the double Vraska's fall at the perfect times there is going to lead to a not particularly interactive game. And two and two heading into round five. All right, here we are now for game number five with a pretty great curve. Look out into Batterfist. If we make it to our higher mana values, of course, the rabble. Gonna be topping things off for us. Second travel. Very cool card. But we are looking for more lands right now. Opponent is on white. White black from our opponent. Fleshless Gladiator is gonna be their first play. No lands for us. We will just send in the lookout. And I guess send in the rebel as well. 
Same amount of damage either way, but now we have that equipment on the lookout for the future, which is nice. We'll make the lookout dead to a Whisper of the Dross, but I think it's worth it to just push in for more damage. We got 15 lands left in these 30 cards. I guess 14, so slightly under 50-50 chance at drawing a land every turn now. And it was only a little lower than that these last couple turns. We're digging. All right, that's not going to get us there. Scamp does trade into Duelist if they block, so I'll just hold on to the Hex Gold Slash and send in the squad. I could also do the really cute play of just putting the batter fist on the scamp and then they just trade naturally as well. I'll counter their card draw and kill the duelist here. Pass turn. Opponent is at 5 mana now, we're chilling over here on 2. Can be a benefit in this format, as we saw in our second win. If we start hitting our lands, this just means that we have all this gas to keep playing. And there is the first land draw of the game. Opponent is already down to 11, just look out with Batterfist, as I said before, just puts in work. Send it in, get them down to 9, and then drop an Aspirant. With Rhea Eivor, they can choose not to deal damage to us. If they do, they'll make 3 Mites instead, but the Mites can't block. But that could stack up into a pretty explosive board state, which can be an issue. Ooh, they're going to lose some more life to another copy of Infectious Inquiry. They're definitely up in card advantage from playing 2 copies of that, but pretty low on life against our flying, swooping lookout. That could be pretty good. Are they going to go for the attack with the Bane of Bladehold? If they do, Aspirant gets to chip in and we hit them for four. Yeah, they're going to do it. Luckily, we do have a Hazardous Blast to just clear out all the mites. If we're that worried about that later on. I can't actually threaten lethal? Oh yes I can, yes I can, because I can play this batter fist by having another artifact on board. The onslaught is now cheaper, and then I can move the batter fist for free to the aspirants, attack with both, they can't block either, and then we give the board plus two plus one and that's just game. The fact that we get to play the batter fist for only one mana thanks to the aspirants means that I can then cast the Batter Fist and the Onslaught there. I mean, I guess I didn't need to play the Batter Fist, but because I could, I might as well. Because I could have just uh, spent zero to move this Batter Fist to the Aspirants. Or just not moved at all, just attacked both and played Onslaught. But yeah, being able to play the Batter Fist and do the Onslaught is even more damage and leaves us with a blocker in case something bad happens. So that is the much cooler line, but I guess, yes, it would it would have been just lethal either way since they couldn't block. All right. Yeah, that's pretty nasty. Three and two now. Here we are in round six. Opponent is on the play. They have taken a mulligan. This is going to be a definite keep for us. Batter Fist and Duelist. We can play on two. War Whip on three. We've got a Slash as well for interaction. I think opponent has taken a second mulligan. Pretty rough for them here. Yeah, they're going to start with a five-card hand. So we'll start with the red source so we can slash if we want to. Slash will not kill incisor glider, so I don't really want to do that. I think I'm going to play batter fist first. Uh, usually I like playing duelist first and then batter fist on turn three, because then I can move the batter fist onto the duelist and attack with a three power first striker. But with this hand, we're going to want to just play a war whip next turn most likely. So we'll just play the batter fist first so we can attack into the glider with that. We'll just play the war whip or the aspirant next turn. Since we have three mana cards to play. Alright, play our land, send in the attack. We are going to trade into the incisor glider. 
potentially vanish into eternity to exile the batter fist that's fine they'll still just bounce off each other then sure cool with me now we play the war whip and they don't have the way to exile the war whip red white from our opponent Probably on Aspirant and Hexgold Slash here. Got the mana to do the Hexgold Slash and... They do just have a second Vanish into Eternity. Well, they're down to one card now. We're getting two for ones here because even if they're exiling the equipment, we're leaving the Rebels behind. So they're spending one card to deal with half of our threats. So we are... Just already ahead in card advantage because they mulligan twice, but just miles ahead because our equipment are both an equipment and a creature, and they're only dealing with the equipment half, but not the creature half. So feels like a really good position to be in here. Now we do have the five mana for the Furnace Strider. Obviously, just attack with that and our Menace creature. Hit pretty hard. They are down to 12. Pass the turn. Keep this if I draw my action engraver. Um, I haste out another 2-2 and attack with everybody. If they block and kill a 2-2, they take 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Go to 2 life. Feels worth it. Put them to two, let them kill one of our two twos. So, kill the best one, Duelist of Deep Faith. No, kill a rebel. Okay. They are down to two. Here's a Cacophony Scamp. And pass the turn. Apostle of Invasion is a pretty big flyer, but not going to be enough to block all of our aggro there. So that is now going to be 4 and 2, guaranteed a positive record out of this draft. All right, here we are for game number 7. We've got Hex Gold Slash and a War Whip in the early game. Little bit low on early game stuff, but that is good enough for me. Evolving Adaptive turn 1, we're just going to shoot that thing before it gets any bigger. It's just going to level up as the game progresses, getting more power and toughness every time they play a bigger creature. So I'm just going to kill it while they're tapped out. Now, Vat of Rebirth is the next play from our opponents. Play Planes and Pass. This doesn't really do anything until their creatures and artifacts start dying. So we'll drop our War Whip here. Got that Indiana Jones sound effect in the building. And we're just going to curve out aggressively. I don't really think I need to annex Sentry anything away right now. Green Sun's Twilight for three, so play that as a draw two. Pick up a spider and a land, so just the green divination there. Three mana draw two is pretty fine. Got a Hex Gold Slash, but I'd rather just rabble it up. Push in aggressively. Keep the pressure on our opponent. We may have been on the draw this game, but we are certainly on the offensive. I've gotten against all odds once my creatures start dying. Got a bunch of mana up for potential trick. I kind of want to hold up Hexagold Slash here. So do I play the Annex Sentry now? Yeah, I think I'm going to hold up Hexagold Slash. So we'll play the Sentry here to hold it up. Kill the Flyer, I guess. Don't think Hexagold Slash is actually going to be big enough to do much, but we'll see. All right, no trick from them. They just get one counter on the Vat of Rebirth. This doesn't do anything until it has four, so we're doing fine. They're green-black, so a lot of their creatures will have Toxic to potentially get slashed, and they're just already over it. We just had a pretty aggressive curve. Our opponent did not have the proper defenses for it in hand, Just kind of a rough draw for them, so that's going to be another pretty uninteractive game in general in the format. And we're going to be 5 and 2. Very positive record for the deck. Here we are for game 8. We've got a Hex Gold Slash and Aspirant in the early game. If I hit a White Source, we have some other plays. So this is kind of similar to last game's hand where we had Slash and a 3-drop. 
I'm not that opposed to keeping. Doesn't curve out super well though when we are on the play, so just mulliganing to potentially have one drop, two drop does feel valuable as well. And obviously the mana could be a big issue here if we don't find the wide source. A lot of dead cards, so I think I'm still going to take the mulligan here since we're on the play, but I think on the draw I would probably keep this. Gives us another draw step to find the white source, and we still have the early slash, the three drop, which is fine. But I think I'm more concerned with trying to make the most of an aggressive curve when I'm on the play, so we'll take the mulligan here. And this is pretty similar. Our mana base is better here, but we only have one castable card for now. No interaction, no removal spells isn't great, but Duelist on 2, Rabble on 4, not horrible. A more consistent hand, but the other one has a little more upside if we drew just the correct cards on curve. This one we're a little less worried about what we draw, as long as we hit one land by turn 4, like we're pretty golden. We just won't be doing anything super nasty, not like perfectly curving out. We're missing a 3 drop. And missing removal. Alright, turn one Fusling from our opponent is making it look like uh, the other hand might have been better, because just killing the Fusling immediately would be a fine way to start a game. I go Duelist over just this here, because without any other artifacts in hand, this isn't that likely to be able to attack in the Fusling. But the Duelist can just always send in, and then we can just trade Justicier off on blocks. Although I'd rather just discard the Justicier to an Engraver trying to hit more lands for these bigger cards. So we're going to be on Engraver this turn, but I will send in the Duelist. Get in our 2 damage here, drop Engraver, drop a Mountain and pass the turn. And we've got a nice 1-3 blocker for their current board state. Our opponent is on red-green, which is the strongest archetype. They have the cards for it. This is probably a free from flesh to put two oil counters on that and give it plus two plus two. If it is, I should probably just use it even if I don't block just to hit us for like a million. But it looks like they are not going to use it there. We'll go ahead and engrave immediately trying to hit the fourth land for the rabble. If we don't, we just play another duelist. We do not. We do hit an annex sentry. Okay, that makes blocking Fusling to try to get the Free From Flesh to happen kind of appealing. So I think I'm going to go Duelist. And then after they dump a bunch of counters on Fusling with their combat trick, we'll uh, Annex Sentry it away. Again, Free From Flesh is a 1 mana instant to give a creature plus 2 plus 2 and put 2 oil counters on it. A lot of ramp here. Well, now it might just be Titanic Growth. Plus four, plus four. We'd rather block the Convert if that's the case. Oh, it is free from flesh. They're just okay with not putting the counters on the Fusling. Ooh, Hex Gold Slash is the draw. I discard Furnace Rider and I hit a land, then I can play Annex Sentry and Hex Gold Slash here. Probably best to just play the sentry. I can always slash the fuseling later. It's always going to be one toughness. So just sentry the convert and keep them off of some ramp. And then just hold the engraver up on blocks still. This seems pretty fine to me. Dune Mover, that will guarantee the next land for our opponent. The Cultivator as well can untap a land, but they need to get some oil counters on it first. They are going to hit another red source. Another mountain on top, and they will pass the turn. Do not hit a land, we hit a Cacophony Scamp. That is immediately going to get filtered away, looking for another land, I think. Yep. There it is. We can play a Chimney Rabble here, which they can double block with a 2-1 and a 1-1 or a 2-1 and a 1-2. Those are all fine for us. Do they have a good block for Duelist of Deep Faith? Not really. Because of that first strike, they could block it with like all three creatures to guarantee it dies, but we kill the other two. Yep, we're on Chimney Rabble. 
attack with everybody but the Annex Sentry. Because I'm still not in love with the triple block on Annex Sentry, and it's only dealing one extra damage. Alright, we're just going to get in. Get them down to nine here. There's the oil counter on the Cultivator. Likely a Cinder Slash Ravager here. A big old 5-5 five, five shoots everything. No, Urbrask's Anointer is the play. Does two damage when it hits the board. But it is a 4-2. It's a two toughness creature, so our Hex Gold Slash is enough to clear that out of the way and keep attacking with Chimney Rabble. We do let their Fusling keep popping off. probably fine like we're on the aggressive here can let fusling get back bigger as the game progresses yeah i feel like i'm getting this anointer out of the way make it easier for rabble to send in and we try to keep things aggressive play our own fusling so if anything trades off we get some counters on that. Um, they don't have a block that can kill Engraver unless they let us kill one of their two ones. So we'll send both in. Oh no, they have the one mana trick with Cultivator here. One mana trick off Cultivator would be pretty disgusting here if they have a second free from flesh in the hand. Nope. Alright. Luckily no trick there, so we will just wipe out most of their small creatures and buff up our Fusling. If they have a Cinder Slash Ravager coming down, that's going to be pretty devastating. That is a 5-5 five, five Vigilance that deals 1 damage to our entire board. Pretty incredible card, the best signpost uncommon. One of the reasons green-red is very powerful. Luckily they don't have they don't have that, so they are going to Ruthless Predation to kill our Exuberant Fusling. That's nice, Chimney Rabble's a good draw here. Keep sending in with that. Not great if they top deck one of their one damage to everything spells. But uh, pretty reasonable here. Uh, they could trade a combat trick into Annex Sentry, but if they had one, they would have used it last turn. So unless they top deck the combat trick here, I think this attack is good. We hit for five if they kill our goblin. It's good. To, I think it's actually just fine to send in a goblin as well. Let them get a free kill if they want it. So there's a block on Chimney Rabble. Untap a land. Maze's Mantle on the Cultivators. They did hit a combat trick, but it's only big enough to kill the Rabble, not big enough to kill the Sentry. So now... They have six mana. Silvok Battle Chair is the play. Very big creature. Very, very big creature here. That's an issue. I can play Furnace Strider and haste it. They kill the Strider and take four, go to two life. Next turn, they have two blockers against four attackers. It's risky, but if they don't play another creature, that gets them killed in two turns. Yeah, their only block they can go for is the block on Strider. Make them need another creature here. All right. Creature or removal spell or you are dead. And we have several outs that will kill them even if they play another creature or removal spell. Obviously our hazardous blast. Uh, we don't have the mana for the wanderer. Um, yeah, hazardous blast and some other stuff would work here. Ossification, of course, would work even if they play a creature. Some cards like that. And then again, if they don't have a creature, they're just already dead on board. Oh, a creature and a removal spell thanks to Urabrask's Anointer. That's a huge out here. Although they are still dead to removal for me because they had to tap Cultivator to do that. They have nothing with reach. Slam in with everybody, I hit them for one. They have to top deck and out for the lookout immediately or they're dead. We give them one turn to draw a removal spell for lookout or they're dead. I think that's where we're at. They get to kill Annex Sentry here and get back their convert, but 
they don't kill us on the crackback, and this gives them one turn to find a way to kill a flyer in, in an empty hand here. All right, you have one draw to kill this swooping lookout. Can you do it? Or kill us. I mean, they're attacking for 15, so I guess a combat trick does it. But combat tricks and removal spells are usually about four or five cards in the entire deck. They've already used several. Let's see. That is going to be game in our favor. And we are now six and two, heading into the final round, the final game of Magic, no matter what. Going to be a nice, nice draft here, getting all the way to the final boss and playing as many games as possible. Time to head into round number nine. Here we are in the final round on the play. No one, two, or three mana creatures can often be a death sentence in this format, but we have a slash to interact early in the game and a blast if my opponent plays a lot of one toughness cards. This is super, super borderline between a keep and a mulligan. But I think similar to our last hand here, I think I'm going to mulligan look for one of those two, three mana plays we can actually get onto the ground. And there we go, double batter fist now. Maybe even ditch a Chimney Rabble? Keep a Blast? Feels probably wrong. Probably ditch Blast, keep a Rabble. I'm not going to ditch a Land or a Batter Fist because that's my turn 3 play as well here. It's actually pretty difficult to choose what to get rid of here. I guess I'll get rid of the... I think I'll get rid of the Blast and just curve out. Batter Fist, Batter Fist, Rabble and just go from there. When it goes forced into Evolving Adaptive, pretty disgusting. One of the best uncommons in the entire format. I think it is the best uncommon in the whole format. Just levels up as the game progresses, does some really nasty stuff, and at this point in the game, just hits the board and blocks, which is also important. Although they are just going to take the three here. I'm not going to play another Artifact next turn for Justicia, so I think I just play another Batter Fist and then Rabble next turn. Yeah, this seems fine by me. Just issue you're just a little awkward here. Save that for later. There's an Iker Spit Basilisk. Luckily, just trades into a 3-1. Now I kind of want to play War Whip instead of Chimney Rabble, so I don't trade my 3-3 into the Basilisk. Although trading a 3-3 into it isn't the end of the world, and we still get a 1-1 off the card. Best way to use all of our mana here. But trading these two two rebels off is going to feel really good if we can accomplish that. Tremendous amount of pressure on my opponent's life total either way. Yeah, I'll just go for that. Hit for three. Drop War Whip. And have a double striking 3-1. Just super nasty. If my opponent doesn't go Mountain Hazardous Blast, this should be pretty disgusting. Oh shoot, I forgot this thing also makes your other equipment cheaper, so it's zero mana to move it around, so I just shouldn't even have put it on yet um, until later. Right now I can just rabble, because if rabble trades in the Basilisk, that's fine. We still have the double striking rebel doing things. We're just going. We're just going. All gas, no breaks. As you want to do in this format. I'm going to take 9 here to keep their adaptive on board. No, they are finally going to trade it off. Take 6. Well, I can move my Batter Fist for free, but uh, I don't really want to kill one of my 1 Toughness creatures, so we'll leave the Batter Fist unequipped all alone over there. Fingers crossed, no Whisper of the Dross from our opponent for their black mana. That's a minus 1, minus 1 spell. That would be quite good on our 3-1. Oh, just play a Spore Singer. Cacophony Scamp's going to be super nasty here. Because I can just kill the Spore Singer, Spore Singer with it by putting the Batter Fist onto it. And then attack them for 7 guaranteed. No, they have the Whisper of the Dross that is very good there. 
Well, never mind about that play. Hmm, these batter fists actually look really bad on this board state. Probably run out the Justiciar and the Scamp. I might still Scamp the Sporsinger way and just hit them for one, and then next turn Justiciar with a whip on it could be pretty good. It does actually feel pretty reasonable. We still hit them. For one by doing this, and it's just a one for one trade of our creatures on board. Clear the path for our next stuff, potentially. Shieldred's Head Cleaver is the play. I'll slap a whip onto the Justiciar, and they kind of have to block there. Trade with Head Cleaver or take four? So the trade will occur. They are down to six, and we pass the turn. Skull Dweller. Actually not super great against a War Whipped 1-1, one -one, but Plague Nurse is plenty large enough. Go ahead and cycle our Fair Basilica, see what we draw into. A Duelist of Deep Faith. That is gonna be pretty good with a War Whip on it. Only big enough to trade into the Plague Nurse, but still going to be good. Alright, our opponent is also cycling their lands. Sacrifice the Hunter Maze to draw a card. They're going to send the Plague Nurse in. Okay, you got it. Must really want us corrupted here. Branch Blight Stalker's the play. Alright, they're not going to have any good blocks for the Duelist now. They could trade into the Goblin. I'm kind of interested in allowing that and just making the Fusling bigger so we have a large double striking Trampler in the future. Yeah, they have no blocks for Duelist of Deep Faith other than a Chump. Uh, but they do trade into the Goblin. So they're just going to let the Goblin in to keep the Fusling smaller here. I could just start sacking everything to Batterfists if I need to buff the Fusling later, which is really cute. Since I get to move the Batterfists for free, thanks to the War Whip. They are going to send in the squad. I will take all of that damage and try to crack back for lethal. It's going to be 5 poison here, put us to 7. Unless they triple proliferate, they probably die on the crackback. And that's our plan. Bilious Skull Dweller is fine. Siphoner's fine. They have 2 total toughness. Oh wow, and we just have the Wanderer anyway. This will be the first game we get to win off the Wanderer, so... I guess might as well. Might as well win off the Wanderer, but I think we would have won off of... Um, putting the whip on the Fusling and sacking the rest of our creatures, we'd have a 6 power double striking Trampler. I guess we put them to 1. Uh, but yeah, we can just minus 4 the Wanderer and say, I'm going to keep Duelist and you can keep a tapped creature and I'll hit you for 6. Might as well. And there you have it. That is a seven win run for this quick draft of Phyrexia. All will be won. Some really great stuff overall from the deck. We can take one last look at it before we end the video. But great value from the event. We did leave with a good bit more gems than it took to enter. So one last look at the deck. Honestly, the biggest underperformer was the Eternal Wanderer, I guess. We won... Two games off the Eternal Wanderer. Um, and I think Wanderer was in our hand in uh, in both the games we lost. Maybe not. It mulligan her away quite a bit. But she's not an underperformer because she's a bad card. She's still incredible. It's just that uh, she didn't win a million games like you would expect her to. Uh, other than that, though, every single thing in the deck just showed up the right times, did its thing. Justicia was never doing anything insane. Scamp was fine. 
but I'm very, very happy with this deck overall in terms of how it, uh, how it played out, how it was built, how we drafted. I think everything here kind of worked together pretty well. Did get some losses under our belt, but that's always going to happen. That is part of magic. I don't think the losses were because this deck is horrible. I think it's just our opponent's decks were a little better or curved out a little better. Definitely happens. 7-2, great run. I think a great deck overall. And pretty happy with it. I guess the only thing I would say is I think we probably should have been on 16 lands from the start. And I also forgot to put the Fair Basilica in for the first two games. So those were the two... The two big flaws. I think we should have been on 16 lands, and we should have had Fair Basilica in from the start. Outside of that, though, excellent stuff for today's draft. Well, that is going to end today's video. If you enjoyed the video and you'd like to see more like it, make sure to stick around, like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more of these videos in your recommended feeds. If you'd like to hang out with me live, I stream multiple times a week at the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel directly as these lovely patrons have, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. And as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.